Yeah, so I'm uh, Simon. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks a lot for being here. Um, this lecture is about quantum algorithmic techniques. Now, what does that mean? It can mean a lot of things. Uh, and I could have talked about many things, but uh, I chose a couple of things which I think are a bit more modern in a sense. Like if you look at modern quantum algorithmic papers, then you'll see these type of words. I'll talk about linear combination of unitaries. I'll talk about block encodings, things like that. They pop up everywhere. So I thought, I thought this was kind of fitting um, to get you on top of these techniques. Now, given that we're also uh, in a physics center, which I find kind of frightening, I'll uh, try to give it a bit of a physics edge but you cannot ask me any questions about it. <laughs> so what I want to uh, talk about is this, this, one, um, this one problem or, or technique rather, which is imaginary time evolution. I think it sounds very nice, imaginary time evolution. So let's see what it, what it does. And in fact, the weird thing with imaginary time evolution is that there won't be an I, whereas in real time evolution, there is an I. So uh, you have to cut me some slack here. So what I'm first going to describe is what is uh, real time evolution, okay? So I'm going to try to write, and I'm going to ask you if this is readable. Is this readable? Is that okay? Okay. If not, because it's going to deteriorate a bit, then you can always uh, follow the written notes online. Okay. <laughs> so real-time evolution, what do I mean by that? Uh, this is essentially what we mean when we talk about uh, Schrodinger's equation. Okay. So as a computer scientist, I had to look up what Schrodinger's equation is, which is the time derivative of some quantum state at time t, psi t is equal to minus i h psi t. And this is for t real. So this is also why we call it real time evolution. Um, so this is Schrodinger's equation, kind of underlies whatever we're doing, but we never really encounter it or we never really deal with it. Uh, and I'm gonna try to limit that as well. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that this implies that if a system evolves according to Schrodinger's equation. Um, so again, this is specified by some state space in which these quantum states live and a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is completely, dis like, um, completely defined uh, the dynamics of the quantum system. Indeed, what we get is that some initial state psi zero get maps to some state psi t, which takes the form e to the minus i h t psi zero. This is just quantum dynamics. So this is a, this Hamiltonian is a Hermitian matrix, but by taking this complex exponential of it, we get a unitary uh, uh, propagator or evolution. Matrix. So this is a unitary, right? So we're kind of back in sort of comfortable area where uh, quantum states get mapped to other quantum states through unitary transformations. Okay. Now the thing with, with, with this is that, um, this somehow rotates the state in quantum space. Um, uh, like what we could do is, and I'll already do it because it's going to be useful for later on. We can kind of have this, this spectral decomposition, lambda j, vj, vj, where these are eigenvectors of h, these are eigenvalues of h, these are real. We're even going to assume that they're non-negative, so lambda j greater than or equal to zero. And so what we get here is that if psi zero takes the, the form, so this is from the basis, so we can decompose this as alpha j vj, then we'll see that by linearity, this exponential acts on every eigenvector individually, and it'll take essentially this form, which is some alpha j e to the i lambda j t vj, okay? Now here you see what I mean by rotating, Lambda j is a real number, and as time evolves, this is just a complex number kind of rotates 
on the unit sphere. Okay, so as time goes to infinity, uh, this does not converge or anything. But often we're actually interested in a sort of long-term behavior, uh, and I'll kind of, kind of concretize this by saying that uh, what we're often interested in is not these sort of dynamics, but uh, the uh, ground state, for instance, of this Hamiltonian. Right. So often we're interested in the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And why I'm kind of contrasting this with, 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 with this um, oscillatory behavior is many classical dynamics or dissipative dynamics, they converge to some long-term limit because of this dissipation. Uh, you go to some stationary distribution or whatever. Like we'll, we'll see more, more, more about that on Friday in the quantum walks lecture. Um, and so let's say that in the quantum case, you also want to do that. We want to kind of have some system that starts from some initial state and it converges to this ground state because this is often what we're interested in rather than just looking at the dynamics of a quantum system. So just imagine that we have these, this real axis and you have these eigenvalues. You have lambda zero, lambda one, lambda two, and so on. And let's even assume that this one is zero. And then you have this, this gap here, which we'll call the spectral gap of the Hamiltonian. Okay, and now we're interested in preparing uh, the ground state, which we'll assume is non-degenerate. So there's a unique ground state, which is the eigenvector corresponding to the zero eigenvalue. Okay, and if we're interested in that, then rather than doing this real-time evolution, what we want to do is imaginary time evolution. So what do I mean by that? Let's replace our real time by some uh, complex time instead. Let's minus i t. So t is a real variable, a uh, real value. And this will replace our propagator, our unitary propagator, e to the minus i h t to something that looks like e to the minus t h. And this is kind of the propagator that we'll be interested in. We want to like, have our system evolve according to this operator. So why is that? Because if we use the spectral decomposition, um, like throughout this lecture, I'm always gonna be talking about very well behaved uh, Hermitian matrices and so on. And so matrix functions, you can always think about as you're just applying a function to the eigenvalues of the matrix, okay? So that means that we get this e to the minus t lambda j v j v j. And now as t goes to infinity, as all non-zero um, eigenvalues are positive, all of these kind of go to zero. And so we see that this goes, as t goes to infinity, this goes to the projector onto the ground state. So v0, v0. So in fact, we don't even need t to go to infinity. We even, it suffices to have like t much larger than one over the spectral gap. This is something that you see in, 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 in many fields, many areas of spectral gap is kind of important. The large gap is good, small gap is bad. A large gap will make this term converge very fast to this ground state projector. Okay, so that means that if we're given some uh, initial state psi zero, uh, which we'll assume has a non-zero overlap with the ground space. Okay, so we get some ansatz or something, and it has a non-zero overlap with the state that we're interested in, this ground state. Then we get that e to the minus h minus th applied to this initial state psi zero as t becomes much larger than one over delta, will uh, effectively implement this projection onto the ground state, okay? So we get the state V0 with a prefactor uh, that depends on the overlap of the initial state. So that's why also we want it to be non-zero because otherwise this would just be zero. And so this is proportional to 
this ground state that we're interested in. Okay. So you can think about implementing this imaginary time evolution as a way of uh, preparing the ground state of a Hamiltonian. So does that make sense so far? Feel free to ask any questions or uh, interrupt me at a later point. Okay. So assuming that it is, it's that I have a very bad usage of my board, so I have to go there already and um, let's see how this pans out. Um, so I said that implementing this, this propagator, e to the minus IHT, sort of the natural thing that happens to a quantum system, right? So uh, in fact, you could say that you don't have to do anything if you want to evolve according to that, uh, that equation. Now, the second part of the lecture, in fact, be about the fact that it is not. But let's ignore that for a second. And let's say that you know, we have a native quantum system and we can evolve according to this uh, Hamiltonian. So we can do this real-time evolution, but we're not interested in that. We're interested in this imaginary time evolution. So you want to implement that propagator. So the question is how to implement this imaginary time evolution. So how to implement e to the minus t h. And I'll be assuming that be good if you stick to black, black. Okay, and, uh, I lose this one. Yeah, okay. take a fresh one from here. Be generous, but what the second fresh one? Yeah, a fresh what? Fresh pen. Whatever. But not a green one. Not a green one. No, oh, so I have pens here. Okay, so again, how to implement <laughs> how to implement this imaginary time evolution? Okay, and so again, we'll assume as a primitive that we can do this real time evolution because I'm not, I'm not, I'm really not lying when I'm saying that this is sort of the native dynamics of a quantum system, so it feels natural that we can. We can assume that. And so what I'll explain to you is how to do that using just what I'm saying now, namely real-time evolution. But we'll combine that with a technique that is called linear combination of unitaries. And to spoil it a little bit, I emphasize that this real-time uh, evolution propagator is a unitary. In fact, we'll be taking linear combinations of that real-time evolution. So this is kind of a nice technique that we call LCU. Um, and uh, we'll be seeing more of that. Okay. So let's start with some uh, elementary Fourier analysis. Or if you want to be more fancy about it, you call it the Hubbard Stratonovich transform, but I'm not going to write that down. So, what you do is you start from some function that looks like this, and it's supposed to represent a Gaussian. Let's say f of x equal to e to the minus x squared over 2. So, we take this function and we Fourier transform it. So, what happens? Does anyone know? Sorry? Exactly, right? So the Fourier transform of this, let's go to some y, will actually be again proportional to a Gaussian. Okay, so this is very elementary, but still some people got it named after themselves. So more specifically, uh, maybe I'll put this up here. So this is the, this formula is what we call the Hubbard Stratonovich transform. What we can do is we can rewrite this Gaussian as by using Fourier analysis, a linear combination of Fourier modes where these are the prefactors. Okay, so what we can do, we can rewrite this as one over square root two integral of dy 
Then we have a prefactor e to the minus y squared over two. And then we have these complex exponentials like minus i x y. Okay. So this is very elementary free analysis. But it's kind of interesting for us because what we see here is now make this more explicit by doing a change of variables. Let's say that we change x by square root 2t times the Hamiltonian. Okay, then what we get is we get exactly e to the minus t h squared as being equal to 1 over square root 2 pi integral dy e to the minus, again, prefactors. So now this is a matrix function, but these are still just um, scalars. It's the linear combination of the real thing, which is here, e to the minus i y square root 2 t h. Okay? So this y square root 2 t is just a sort of, again, you can think about it as some t prime if you want. So what you really have here is uh, a real-time evolution, right? So what we're doing is we're expanding this imaginary time evolution as an integral, or if you otherwise put a linear combination of these real-time evolution operators, okay? So again, here we kind of get these linear combinations. And uh, this here is now a real and unitary evolution. And this here was our imaginary and unfortunately also non-unitary evolution that we're interested in. Okay. So this is really the gist of it. We're interested in implementing this operator on our initial state size zero, but we can't just do that because it is a also, and, and this is a detail that I'll have to, uh, yeah, thank you. This is a detail that I'll, I'll gloss over a little bit now, but, but we'll come back more, is that this is a non-unitary operation. So you wanna apply this non-unitary operation. And what we can do is we can see it, think about it as a linear combination of, of, of unitary, oper uni unitary operations. And this is where this picture of linear combination of unitaries comes into play. Any questions? Uh, yes. I'm a little bit confused. On the left, you wanted to implement e to the minus th, but now you're implementing e to the minus th squared. Yes, thanks a lot. That's a very good question. Um, so for the purpose of, of this ground state preparation, it doesn't matter. Are you assuming because HSP is D here? H, exactly. I was assuming that, that, that there, it has only non-negative uh, eigenvalues, so single zero eigenvalue and all the others are above a gap of delta. So H has the same spectrum, but squared. So the gap will now be delta squared instead of delta, but your ground state will be exactly the same. Oh, I see. Thanks. Yeah, oh, but that's a good question. Thanks also, I, uh, I should have mentioned that. Uh, so in fact, it seems that, that by implementing this thing, our gap closes a little bit because we go from a gap delta to gap delta squared, but somehow because of very hand waving because of this square root, you kind of gain again. And so in the end, you'll still get a one over delta dependence, but let's gloss over that over it for a sec. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So, and it's still weak because you're trying to divide it kind of everything. It's still it's so readable, more or less. Okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on this. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, talk about this. This apparently black is better than blue. So okay, let's stick to black. Let me just yeah, let me just stick to black. Okay, so I think I'm gonna use a thanks to David. I'll use a fresh board. That's a kind of interesting. Okay, so let's see how we can implement this sort of uh, linear combination of, of unitaries. Um, and I'm kind of focusing on this particular application um, because there's kind of a nice twist to it. It's not quite the usual uh, thing that people think about when doing LCU. 
but but the gist is really just saying. So I might have been too soon on using this board, right? It's yeah, still wet. Yeah, yeah, this one is still wet. So let me go back then. Right. Um, that's why I put a uh, written notes online. I have some slack here. So yeah, the problem is I have a very nice layout and uh, could, it could work really well on this board. So I'm gonna still, uh, sorry, David. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna imagine that you have your main system well, where by system, I mean your main Hilbert space, like this, the, the, the sort of space where your initial quantum state lives, where your Hamiltonian lives and so on. So we'll call that like the primary system. And what we're gonna do is we're kind of gonna kind of append this smaller auxiliary system. It's a bit like in many quantum operations, uh, like when querying an Oracle and so on, uh, you kind of extend the state space, you add these extra qubits to, you know, give you some space to work. So we enlarge the state space a little bit. And now we start with this initial state that we had on the main system, but we're gonna tensor it with a state on his auxiliary system, uh, which is a Gaussian state. So as you've seen that Gaussians kind of play a key role here. So we'll be using Gaussians again. And now we'll be defining a particular Gaussian state uh, namely, so we get something like one over two pi to the one over four integral dy e to the minus y squared over four y. Okay, so this is a Gaussian state. It's a Gaussian quantum state. So if you would measure the state in this um, y basis, you would actually you know, be sampling from uh, a Gaussian. Okay. So there's, this becomes a four and a four here instead of a two because things have to be L2 normalized now. So you have this larger state space, we have a larger state, and now we define a larger dynamics or Hamiltonian. Namely, we define a Hamiltonian H prime, which also takes the tensor product form. Namely, I'll add this weird operator here, Y hat. So this is great for physicists. And uh, I'll tensor it with the original Hamiltonian on the second system. And let me clarify that this y hat here is you can think about it as the sort of position operator. So basically what it tells you is that uh, it looks like this y. So there's a lot of y's. Um, and it's defined such that if you apply this operator to cat y, you'll get this eigenvalue y. Okay, so this y hat operator kind of identifies what the state is of this auxiliary system. Okay, and now I set things up in such a way that if we apply real time evolution now on this larger system. With this extended Hamiltonian, we do it for time t, and we apply it on this initial state y tensor psi. Okay, so what happens is um, what you'll get is you get e to the minus i t, and now h prime is a tensor operator applied to a uh, tensor state. We, we'll effectively get that this position operator uh, works on the first state. So you'll get a Y here. And this operator works on the second state. Um, so let me put it. Identity tensor H on Y tensor Psi. Um, okay, so I should have, okay, let me, let me write it, it's, it's kind of a annoying thing, so let me write it out a bit more carefully, uh, no, 
what we're what we're using here is that h prime on uh, state y tensor psi is effectively equal to y y tensor h psi. Okay, and so this is just a, uh, a real number. So we can rewrite this as y tensor y h on psi. Okay, sorry for being a bit clumsy here. So what we get is that effectively this will equal y tensor e to the minus i t y h applied to psi. Okay, so this is where I want it to be because what it's telling you is that somehow what the system does is it looks at this first register and it looks at the value of this first register. Okay, it's y. And then it's going to apply this uh, e to the minus i th for some you know, extra y here. So somehow you're kind of conditioning the um, evolution on psi, you're conditioning it on the first register. So this is what we call a controlled a controlled Hamiltonian. So it's a bit more cumbersome than, than um, defining controlled Hamiltonians in the usual way, but to me it feels a bit more natural because this is the type of things that, 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 that people actually think about. You know, like Gaussians are kind of things that we can actually prepare. Um, coupling uh, a primary system to some extra system and having a coupled Hamiltonian and all these things, as far as I was told at least, are kind of feasible things. Um, and so this is a way of implementing this controlled Hamiltonian. So again, what, what, what this H prime is doing is we have this initial register, which contains some value Y. Um, and this is going to determine how long we apply the Hamiltonian on the second side. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Uh, could, I'm not, I haven't quite understood. So what is this Y hat object exactly? So you integrate Y and then cat bra Y, Y? Yes. So this is, an, you can think about it as, okay. So this is a continuous state space. Um, so you can think about this as a eigenvalue decomposition of Y. So these are its eigenvectors. This is the corresponding eigenvalue. And we're just, you, everything works for discrete state spaces as well. So you could have imagined a sum here, but working with Gaussians, things pan out nicer if, if, if you work with the continuous state spaces. So it's like an uh, exponential, uh, infinitely large vector space. Yes, it's a Hilbert space. Yeah, it's like a continuous Hilbert space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm already getting a bit uncomfortable. Sorry, uh, I was going to ask uh, just yes. to follow up on that. Um, so why I'm integrating over real numbers here. Yes. This is an uncountably large space. Yes. This goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So it's a continuous state space. Okay. So if it makes you more comfortable, like, you can think about this as a sort of uh, like a conceptual tool, but you can discretize this. You can discretize this Hubbard Shatonovich transform everything so that you're back to like even a, you know, a countable and even a finite state space and everything goes through with some epsilons and deltas, but I want to kind of avoid that. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Maybe I can allow myself a comment as a physicist. I think we can hear tell the computer scientists from the physicists, because you know that is what we do in day one of quantum mechanics one, that is the position operator. And it's generally considered to be an infinitely more natural object than any of this qubit magic than, <laughs> that, that we are talking about here. Thank you. Okay, so um, that almost concludes it because I'm gonna put a lemma and, 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 and we'll just remain to prove this lemma. So what the lemma is, is we start from that state. We start from a Gaussian tensor psi. So let me try to be strategic here. So we have our Gaussian here, tensored with the initial state of our system. And now we're gonna do a natural real-time evolution according to this Hamiltonian H prime, okay? So what we get is we just evolve it for a time square root 2t. 
h prime. Okay, so again, we're on this larger state space and we evolve this initial state uh, using the modified Hamilton. And now I'm going to put a slightly, for some people, maybe a bit of a strange object here. I'm going to say like, if, what I'm saying is that here we actually already did most of the work. So why is that? It is because I'm claiming that if we do this thing, then, and I'll explain what this is in a second, then what we get is our initial state kind of nicely stays a Gaussian. Sorry, our uh, auxiliary system remains a Gaussian state, but in the second register, we get exactly what we want. We get e to the minus th squared psi. And so again, up to the square, it's exactly what we want. With the square, it's still, it's still good enough for our purpose. So I'm claiming this, uh, and I want to walk you through what everything means here. So I already clarified that this is our initial state. This is essentially solving Schrodinger's equation or integrating our quantum system, but on the larger state space. But now the question is, what is this thing here, right? So this thing is, uh, you can think about it as we're kind of projecting the first auxiliary system into a Gaussian state. So what we want, what I'm saying is that, okay, a bit more operationally, you can think about this as, um, you can think about this as performing a measurement. So what we've seen, Ronald talked about uh, doing measurements in the computational basis, kind of clear, you, know, you take a qubit, you measure it at zero or one. But in fact, you can measure a qubit in any basis that you would like to, as long as sort of, well, it's not even necessary, but, but, but kind of easiest if this is just an orthonormal basis. And so what we can do is you can sort of imagine that we do a measurement in, uh, in uh, this basis that consists of a Gaussian and then just a bunch of orthogonal states to this Gaussian. Okay, so we're kind of just asking, like, is this initial, this auxiliary system, is the Gaussian state or not? And I'm measuring that. And what I'm saying is that if uh, the measurement outcome gives me a Gaussian, so you know, indeed this was a, 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 um, was a Gaussian, then the post-measurement state, which will be this one up to normalization, is exactly the state that we're interested in. So again, we take this initial state, we evolve it, and then we do this measurement. And this measurement has some success probability, namely, if the measurement returns a Gaussian state, then we're good, because then the post-measurement state is exactly the state that we had projected onto this Gaussian, and that's exactly uh, is exactly the right thing, right? Because this is what we're interested in. We might also get a different state and then we kind of reiterate this. So it's a bit like Ronald was explaining that in amplitude amplification, you prepare a state, but you're only interested in part of that state. Like some part of the state actually did what you wanted, what you want to, uh, the other part did not. And you want to kind of measure and hope, you know, cross your fingers and hope to get the right outcome. If not, you repeat and you repeat. Um, and specifically, what you can show is that the success probability of this measurement is exactly sort of norm of this projection, uh, and that's equal to the norm of this thing. So that's just Gaussian tensor e to the minus t h squared psi squared. But because this thing is normalized, this is equal to e to the minus t h squared psi. And recalling that this, we chose our t so that essentially this equals um, uh, the projector onto the ground space. You see that this is effectively equal to the projection of our initial state onto the ground space. So this is to be expected, right? If we have an initial state, we had to assume that it had a non-zero overlap with the goal state that we want, the ground state that we want. Um, uh, and a, even more quantitatively, the larger this overlap is, the better. Okay, if you just have a very tiny overlap, then we'll see that this, this, this final measurement will give us the right state with only a small probability. If you have a larger probability, a larger overlap, and this will have a larger success probability. Okay, so let's see. So I can go over uh, the proof, but this is really just some 
you just write out these these integrals. In fact, you can find it on the on the notes online. Um, it's not particularly insightful. Uh, it's not so hard to check. So I encourage you to check it, but but let's let's skip it for now. Um, let's just glance at this for a little bit. And and I'm sure there are questions about this. So let's uh, see. Yes, thank you. I did not really understand about the measurement. So in the measurement, you are basically measuring in a certain basis, but the first state is always this end state, yeah. followed by the uh, tensor product of anything. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, you're right. So so indeed, um, you can imagine measuring uh, just the first, just the first part. We're just measuring the auxiliary system. Like we don't want to measure the second part because this part we kind of don't want to perturb. Right, so we just measure this first part. It's a bit like measuring a single cube, like what I was explaining in, in amplitude amplification. You have a state that we're interested in and a flag that is zero or one. And so we'll measure the flag. Uh, we'll see if it's good or, or bad. And then, you know, if, if it's good, we actually have the, right, the, the state that we want. We don't want to perturb that state. Yes. Since I know the person who asked the question is a physicist, right? Again, in, in standard quantum mechanics terms, it's super easy because you just measure the first system in the eigen basis of a harmonic oscillator and, and uh, you want the ground state to come out. No? Just a caution. Yeah. So, yes, indeed. So, this is, again, one of the reasons why I kind of like this, this sort of narrative is because it, 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 it's kind of close to, to physics, right? Like uh, these states. This, this Gaussian state is supposedly a natural thing because one of the first systems that you study as a physicist is a quantum harmonic oscillator, and then this is one of the ground states. Yeah, what do you mean it's supposed to be a natural thing? Indeed, yeah, it's the harmonic oscillator, the one thing in physics, right? The, <laughs> yeah. They say physics is the part of the human experience that can be reduced to harmonic oscillators. <laughs> okay, yes, so... Simon, can I still ask a question? Yes. The last e equality that you wrote, I guess that's only approximately, right? And it's, that's and only it, it's assuming that T is much bigger than one over gaps. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, so you. this is the situation that we're going to be interested in. We're going to want to t choose T so large that 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 essentially, uh, but in fact, okay, this is exact, right? It's at least this large because this part doesn't change. Um, now, I'm talking about ground state preparation where you want to take T to be very large so that everything kind of goes away except for this ground state. But in fact, um, you can use this to, like this operator, even for a finite time, has a, has a meaning. Um, like you can think about it as some uh, classical dynamics or some classical evolution. In fact, that's how we use it in, 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 in some people. We use it for finite T, not for T going to infinity. So even for in the sort of intermediate case, like there's something to it. Okay, so is there any more questions about this? Yes. Um, so with Grover's algorithm, we saw if we had some algorithm that works with a particular success probability, we can then boost yeah. like the, well, reduce the number of runs we need to do to actually get this thing. So can you then apply Grover's algorithm to exactly. this? Exactly, so that's a, that's a very nice question. Thanks a lot for that. Um, so indeed, what you see is that in, in, in Ronald's you know, uh, presentation, there was this zero that we care about. I think it was, or was the one, the good state, a one. Okay, so we wanted the one. Now, uh, it's just slightly different. We want to have this Gaussian state right, instead of a sort of one. Um, so indeed, we measure it, and we get this certain success probability. And exactly like you're saying, um, if, if we just, if you're interested in, in, in preparing this state, then we can repair it one over the success probability times, right? Uh, so we'll get a complexity of one over this times the kind of complexity of this of this of this scheme. But indeed, using amplitude amplification, uh, we can actually boost that so that overall we'll just need this operator a number of times, which is one over like, this thing, actually the square root of that. Yeah. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let me just briefly before we'll take a break, um, let me just describe, I wanna, I wanna write a more general form, but it's, a, it's also a discrete version of all of this. 
um, but I'll still write it here. Uh, more general. So what's the more general form of this LCU technique? So what you see here is that we somehow had this state that we want to apply this uh, Hamiltonian or you know this this uh, evolution conditioned on somehow the prefactors in this state. Right, this state is kind of telling you how many steps uh, you want to apply the the, the unitary evolution. And then we'll kind of post select on this thing. Now you can kind of abstract it out much more generally and say that, let's say that we're given now a controlled unitary. And this controlled unitary is exactly uh, what I was talking about here. So I'm, I'm writing controlled Hamiltonian, but, but really it's a controlled unitary, right? We're applying this unitary um, depending on the first register. So in discrete state space, you would write this something like, in the first register, you have some time, and then conditioned on that time, we'll apply our unitary, say, p times, right? Um, and then we also have some sort of function of time, which indicates what kind of linear combination that we want to apply. So essentially, think about this as being the sum square root f of t, t. Uh, so here I'm assuming that f of t is greater than or equal to zero, and this thing should should uh, be normalized. So we also assume that sum of f of t is equal to one. You can generalize way beyond that, but for now that 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 that, that suffices. So we just have these very simple uh, definitions, and then what we get is by essentially the same calculation as as you're doing here, if Okay, I should I should have written it the other way around. Essentially, if you start from you have this auxiliary register, which is in this state f, kind of controls the, the type of linear combination that we want to apply. We have our state psi here, the state in the main system. We apply this controlled unitary. So again, this is a bit like 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 applying exactly this one, and f now takes this place. And then we post select on this thing. Now what you can see is that, and this holds in general, is that we get. This is equal to f times sum of f of t u to the power t psi. And so this was the linear combination of unitaries that we wanted to apply. And this is how we do it, right? We define this controlled unitary, we define this, 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 this uh, f, and um, kind of post select on being back in this f. Okay. And with that, I'll kind of and go into a break. This is what we call LCU, in a combination of unitaries, and we'll see more applications of that uh, in the second part. So maybe I'll first take any more questions, if there are any. Um, yes, Simon. Um, so the probability of this working scales with your original overlap with the ground state, yeah? Yes. Good, so is there any advantage to doing this over just phase estimation? Mm, I think you have to do, well, phase estimation is not so trivial, right? You need to do quantum Fourier transform and stuff like that. I don't think you need that here. You mean, like phase estimation, I just say you take the state, um, you run the phase estimation algorithm on your Hamiltonian, e to the IHT, and you measure, repeat the Spalding number of times, and then you okay. pick the outcome okay, so with the smallest value that comes out. I but, think for this particular application of ground state preparation, uh, that would probably work just as well because you just need this sort of resolution of uh, you know, delta, right? And in fact, on Friday, I'll talk about pretty much that in, in the context of quantum walk search. Um, the reason why this scheme is more interesting is probably precisely for the application that I did not discuss now, which is where, where T is finite. Uh, like we used it in, in, in a setting where this describes like the classical evolution of a, of a system. And we were interested in, in, in like the things you can prepare that essentially in time square root t, whereas classically it would take time t. Um, and, and preparing this state with phase estimation would be much harder, right? Because then all of a sudden, like, um, like here you get it exactly, right? With phase estimation, you would get all these errors, you know, due to the, your, your finite resolution and so on. And that could really mix up things, which you don't have this way. Yes. 
Um, because we only see here what you project onto. How do the other terms look like? You project it out. Um, and you, you don't, don't care. Detail. I mean, I don't care, but I, in this question, I do. Well, so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, this is this this fully defines the state, right? This fully defines the state. Uh, so all your, you know, all the answers to your questions are in this equation. And uh, honestly, um, it's a good question. Often, uh, there's not nothing very interesting going on. Um, but there's a couple of things to say about that. So with this post selection, we kind of throw away a large part of the system. And um, like, I'll probably, yeah, I'll talk about this on, on, on Friday. Uh, in some cases, uh, if this, I'm you know, really jumping ahead, but this is what we call a sort of a block encoding of, of, of an operator. Um, in some formulation of block encodes, we, we actually characterize the full matrix, like not just the block that we care about. And we can do that uh, in certain cases. It's not trivial, but it also gives you a lot of interesting things sometimes. Uh, here, I don't know what happens. Uh, and and for, the, for the purpose of this thing, we, we don't care. But let me try to get back to you on, on Friday. Yes. Um, can you make this more general setting even more general? So say now you have this kind of this, this U is always to the power of T. But what if you have a sequence of unitaries like indexed by t? Do you then get the same kind of result at the yeah, end? Yeah, I mean that you're applying ft to the tth unitary in u. If you put the t here, if you want. Yeah, so you don't necessarily need the power structure. You can just have a sequence of unitaries. Exactly, exactly. And so it's an interesting question because uh, in, in the next part I'll talk about um, Hamiltonian simulation, and in, in Hamiltonian simulation. Um, you're kind of always applying the, the same U to a power, but somehow if you want to do a um, uh, time varying Hamiltonian simulation, then you're varying this, this operator as well. You're not just always applying powers of the same thing. So it's a good thing of LCU that indeed it is more general than that. Like you can apply uh, you know, any operator that you want. Uh, there's also tricks in fact, like, uh, and uh, you know, I've got to give credits to Andres because I was confused. I just asked him and he told me so. You don't need to assume that this is non-negative. Uh, f of t can be an arbitrary complex number. But then, uh, you know, if you want to take the root of this, you'll get in trouble. Uh, so what you can do is you can put the, com like the complex phase inside the u. But then all of a sudden, this thing becomes the function of, of t and the phase, and it's no longer just the power of u. Yeah, so thanks. OK, any more questions? OK, if not, so. Thanks, and uh, let's take a five minute break. Okay. So, uh, welcome again. Um, Gonna start by saying that I actually lied. So Hamiltonian simulation is not necessarily like a native thing on a quantum computer. It is so much not a native thing that, that actually any of the exciting and nice quantum algorithm, algorithmic techniques actually, actually originated in the problem of doing Hamiltonian simulation. So what's the problem here is that that um, quantum computers are, are expected to be digital, just like, like classical computers. So that means that uh, they'll be, like if you think about the circuit model, they'll be operating in discrete time and they'll be operating in discrete space. So discrete time means we're applying these discrete gates. Discrete space means we're working on qubits, right? So I was talking about this sort of continuous state space and you all saw how much, you know, that confused some people because we're so much used to, you know, think about qubits and so on. Um, and for this part, I'm going to gloss over the, the, the space discretization, which I said, you can do it. It's, uh, it's not a problem. I'm going to look at the time discretization. So specifically, I'm going to ask, like, how do we, on a digital quantum computer, uh, integrate Schrodinger's equation, right? So, so how do we integrate some initial state psi zero to some state psi t, which takes the form e to the minus i 
H T psi zero, where H is a Hamiltonian that is given to us somehow. You can think about it as, you know, maybe there's, there's a description of, of, of the interaction in the system, or maybe we have some access to H as a matrix. I'm not gonna go into these details right now, um, but this is gonna be the question, right? So how do we actually integrate such a Hamiltonian? So we can ask, can we do it with, with, with LC? So here you have this function of H, right? So what's a very natural first thing to do is look at the series development of this function, right? So we have e to the minus HT, and we can rewrite this as a sum, K zero to plus infinity, uh, minus I T to the K over K faculty, H to the K, okay? So we're winning a little bit here because whereas this was obviously a continuous time system, here all of a sudden we have these continuous coefficients, but that's fine. Like the real evolution, which is you know determined by this h to the power of k is discrete. Okay. So we're making some headway here because now all of a sudden we have this operator that is discrete. But What's the problem? Like, why can't we yet apply this LCU technique? Yes? It's not a unitary. Exactly, because it's not a unitary. So it's discrete, but it's non-unitary. So kind of this problem kind of nicely captures the two techniques that I want to talk about. One of them is like, let's say we want to implement this general function. You decompose it into simpler objects, right? even in this case, discrete objects. This is what we call LCU. Now, the second problem we encounter here is indeed that this natural decomposition kind of uses these discrete uh, powers now, but of non unitary objects, right? H, like Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian to decay. Any polynomial in H will simply not be a unitary. So, what we do is we use the second technique that I want to talk about a little bit is we use a block encoding. And as you'll see in the exercises, uh, LCU and block encoding is, is kind of very much more closely tied than you'd expect. In fact, you can think about LCU as a form of block encoding. Now, in what sense do I mean that? I mean that in the sense that what we call a block encoding of H, so let's assume just for ease of everything that the one norm of this H is, is smaller than one. Then what we call a block encoding of H is in fact a unitary. So we want to, we want to have a unitary. It's a unitary that takes the following form. It has a upper left block is exactly the matrix that we're interested in. So it's exactly H here. And then, I'm sorry, but about all the rest, we're not going to care. So I just put dots there. And the reason is that we really don't care. So we can rewrite this as, you can again think about this as we have some primary system and we kind of encapsulate it in a larger state space. Because on our primary system, we would like to apply H, but H is not unitary, so we can't just do that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna enlarge the state space. You know, we don't just have H, we have a larger matrix, a larger system, um, but we're gonna want our larger system to be unitary, but potentially non-unitary on the, on the specific subspace that we care about. So you can think about it as we have this sort of zero subspace where this matrix acts as H, and then we have all other stuff that we don't care about. Um, and so in that sense, you can think about LCU as a block encoding in the sense that if you apply U, so basically what we get is, if uh, we apply this U on a state of the form zero psi, where again, the zero lives in this auxiliary system and psi is like the main system where also H lives. And then we do the exact same thing. We kind of look at what happens inside the zero subspace. So kind of, we're just interested in the part that, that goes back to zero. 
then what we get is that this is exactly zero times h psi. So what happens here, we can have this psi, our main system, like the initial state that we care about, we enlarge it. We're now in the sort of the state space where this larger operator acts on. And we start in the zero subspace, right? We could also have a one here or whatever. It could be much larger state space. But we start in the zero subspace. We apply this unitary, and then we kind of project our dynamics back into the zero subspace, right? And again, this here, you can think about as, and now uh, maybe it's easier to understand as, as, a, as a sort of measurement. And now we just measure this first system on the standard basis. If we get zero, we got lucky and we actually get what we want, right? And so again, we have a success probability here by the same argument, which takes the form H psi squared. Uh, repeating this one over H psi squared times will give us what we want. With amplitude amplification, we can kind of boost that a little bit. So notice that this, is, this success probability will not be necessarily be one, precisely because we're applying a image that's not a unitary. Right? If you would be applying a unitary, then this would be exactly one. Uh, so this would always succeed, but kind of defeats the purpose because the point is that we want to implement a non-unitary operator uh, within like a bigger unitary operator, okay? So this kind of is just what we call a block encoding. We're encoding something that's not a unitary into a larger unitary, and we can kind of enforce uh, applying this one block by starting in the right subspace and then kind of post-selecting and being in the right subspace. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay, so then, let me uh, save David some work and let me try to do this. So what we see is that this block encoding, which we'll see for now as a, as a basic building block, like I'm giving you this, and you can see that you can somehow use it to implement this H. So it exercises, it does kind of very natural ways of constructing a unitary that, that exactly has the right block in the right place. Uh, so you can go to exercises to do that. Um, I know that the entire whiteboard is now block encoded. So that's very fitting. Thank you so much. Um, Just a small comment, Simon. Like on the penultimate line, there should be plus dot, 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 right after the state. Uh, no, I'm projecting, right? Oh, you're projecting. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. So without this, so that it's a good remark. Without this, if you apply this, uh, you know, you start in the right subspace, you apply you, then you can kind of expand this state into exactly this state plus some other garbage stuff. But we're kind of, you know, shifting it away by uh, like kind of destroying it by this measure. Okay, so uh, we see that this implements H. And now assuming that we can also implement identity, which is not so far-fetched, then we see that we already have like two of the terms here, right? We can implement H to the power zero, we can implement H to the power one. But what about H to the power K? Because we're gonna need that. Okay, and now we'll do some uh, fun linear algebra stuff. So we started with this uh, unitary U, right? Um, so let's say that we expand, we kind of give names to these you know, off diagonal blocks and lower, di lower diagonal block. So we have H here, and then we put an L here, an R here, and some D here for down. Okay, and now I'm also gonna assume to make things a bit easier that U is also reflections. So what does that mean? It means that U squared is equal to identity. And in fact, this is not necessarily the case, but uh, in, 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 in certain ways of constructing a block encoding unit, this actually applies and kind of makes our life a bit easier. So let's assume that this also holds. So what does that mean in particular is that if you write out the square of this thing, you get something like H squared plus RL, LH plus DL, HR plus RD, and 
LR plus D squared. And we're assuming that this is equal to identity. So we learn that the diagonal blocks equal identity. This is identity. This is identity. This is zero and this is zero. So this puts certain constraints on the different blocks, All right? Um, okay, so if we assume this, then let me try to then what we get is if we look at not exactly u squared, because what you see is that if you take identity like u to the power zero, you just get identity here, right? Which is you can think about it as a function of h. If you apply u, you get an h. But if you apply u squared, all of a sudden you get these extra like uh, off diagonal blocks you know, coming into play. And we don't want that because as, as I said before, we don't want to care about what these blocks are. So we have to be a bit smarter. So just applying a power of this block encoding will not give us a power of h, unfortunately, because we get these extra blocks that we don't want. So let's be a bit smarter and let's do the following. Let's put the sort of reflection between so we get u, and then we reflect around. And, and, and I want you to think about, um, like say, Grover search, or in fact, many quantum algorithms where these reflections are very natural. So this might seem a bit ad hoc, or like uh, they use ex machina, but it's not. We put this reflection around sort of the, the subspeed that we care about, right? So, so, so realize that this is actually a reflection around the zero state, right? It leaves the zero invariant, and it kind of puts a minus sign uh, before any other state. Then what we can show is that this is equal to, so we get H, we get R, L, D, and then we get H, R, minus L, minus D, and this on its turn is equal to H squared minus R, L. This is a bit tedious, but there's you know, slicker ways to do it, but I think this is the best way to kind of go through the calculation a bit. So we get this thing here. Um, and now it looks a bit like what we had before. Like we still have this R and this L block showing up, but what changed? So now I'm gonna let you glance at it a little bit and I'm gonna ask you like what changed now? Okay. First, I should probably, um, no, I think it's perfectly fine. So what changed now is that we still have this H squared and we have this RL and we would you know, rather have a function and it's just a function of H. But what we just did is we assumed that U squared is identity. So what we assumed for instance, is that this term here equals identity, right? So that implies that this term here, H squared minus RL, Using that RL is equal identity minus H squared, we exactly get two times H squared minus identity. So we get the following block form, which is two times H squared minus identity, and then three don't cares. Okay. So this is not quite H squared, but in fact, I'll tell you it's better than H squared. So so what we get is u to the power zero gives us identity, u gives us h, u squared gives us two h squared minus one. And now the more mathematically inclined might jump up and say, this is a Chebyshev polynomial. So what you can prove is in fact, the following holds. We're going to use this reflection times u as sort of the basic building block. So you can imagine that there was also a reflection here. It doesn't change anything about, about that form. Right? So what I'm claiming is, and you can prove that in the exercises, it's a bit clumsy, but, but, but it's kind of nicely self-contained. 
is that you get a block and what you get on the top left block is the Kvichev polynomial of H. So you don't really need to know what Kvichev polynomials are. The only thing that matters somehow is that they form a basis for the polynomials. So what do I mean by that? Um, that the functions one, x, x squared, so which the monomials are spanned by the Chebyshev polynomials. So they're spanned by essentially these uh, t0 of x, t1 of x, and so on. So what we see is that by applying a power of this operator, so we take the block encoding and we add this like little thing here, then we get this sort of series of, 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 of block encodings, no longer of, of identity and age, but of any like Chebyshev polynomial in fact. Okay. So um, let's see what we can do with that, right? Maybe, are there any questions about this at, at this point? It should not be obvious, I hope. Feel free to. I've got a naive question. Yeah. Um, do you really need the u squared equals identity? Because it seems like then you could do some of square, uh, some of unitaries on the top version and the bottom version to cancel out that borrow. I think you need u squared equal to identity because otherwise this is not supposed to work. Like, um, I think that that what you would need if u squared is not equal to identity, you would need u reflection, u dagger reflection somehow because you kind of need the sort of intermediate use to cancel a bit and and you know here it happens with just you but but, but in the general case you need you and you dagger okay. okay any more questions in fact i thank this to my student uh Marin. like <laughs> i didn't think uh you actually needed that but okay you need it so okay that's that uh, now let's see what we can do with that right in fact we're closing in on Lunchtime, so let's uh, you know try to be uh, punctual about that. So now, what you can do is you can rewrite the following thing. So recall that we're interested in applying this operator, right? Uh, now this is a real-time evolution. Before we saw imaginary time evolution, the way we did it is by kind of placing placing it in a block of a larger matrix that's how we did the imaginary time evolution and now let me also try to do that here right because in fact i already mentioned that we're going to do lcu um and so lcu is a sort of block encoding so what we'll get is we'll get something in the following form e to the minus ith and then we have some of diagonal stuff uh, in fact it'll turn out that these are, are are supposed to be zero but okay let's just put don't care is there. Um, and now what we're going to do is we started by expanding this as a series of, uh, by a Taylor series, right? A series of monomials. But somehow, you know, quantum computing doesn't give us monomials, it gives us KBTF polynomials. So what we do instead is we sum over alpha case TK of H. By the mere fact that the KBTF polynomials form a basis, for uh, the polynomials, we can do this, right? We can always do this. So again, we have don't cares here. And now what we have is we take out the sum. So we get sum alpha k tk of h dot, dot, dot. Okay. But now we know how to implement that as a unitary, right? Because we just saw that if you take u, you multiply with reflection, which is also just a unitary, and take a power of that, we get exactly this block. So we get that this here is exactly equal to some alpha k identity minus identity u to the power k. And now we rewrote the thing that we're interested in effectively as a linear combination of unitaries. Okay. And we're sort of assuming that 
we can implement this LCU technique like we've seen that before. Um, I didn't I, I, I didn't go over all the all the details, but but you know roughly speaking, we know how to do that, and we know how to do this right because I present you this building block, which is a block encoding, and we we've seen how you can build this thing, get these JBHF polynomials from this from this building block, and we're done. Like this is exactly how we can do Hamiltonian simulation by evolving a state in a sort of discretized manner by applying this linear combination of unitary technique, which you can think about, and you can you describe this in the circuit model, and using these sort of block encoding building blocks and applying them here a discrete number of times. Right. So what I'm hiding here a little bit is you're going to care about things, right? You're going to care about what's the power, the, the, the highest power of k in this expansion. If they did precise expansion, then, then, then k will go to infinity, but you just want to apply things like a finite number of times. Just as intuitively you expect the higher k, the higher the cost will be of implementing this thing. This is true. Um, so you're going to want to truncate this and so on. You're going to want to make sure that these alpha k's are, are uh, well behaved, that they sum to one or something like that, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that, that this is really the, the gist of, of, of how you can do it. Um, I also glossed over how to construct this block encoding, but as I mentioned, uh, this will be uh, an exercise. So you're really combining things. It's a good warm up for Friday as well because quantum walks also you can think about it as a form of block encoding. So that's that. So we have five minutes left, and so I'll be happy to take any questions.